Good morning. Um, so, my name is T, <laughs> and um, this is very formal. Um, so, if you wouldn't mind, could we just make this a little bit? <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> come to my side. <laughs> Great. Um, and if it's all right with you, I'm going to sit for this. And the, the floor seems really clean. I'll sit on the floor too if you want. Um, yeah, let's let's do that. Okay. If I sit up here, it's going to seem like story time. That could be kind of funny. All right. Um, maybe I'll do that just because I'm wearing a skirt. Um, so, if we could just, since this is a really nice and intimate um, number of people here, could we do just a, a really quick flip around so I know who you are? Some of you I know already. I'm Maddie. Hello. I'm Caroline. Anna. And what brings you all here this morning? I mean, other than me. <laughs> <laughs> but, so is everyone from VSA or APASU or? No, right? Okay. So what brought you here, Izzy? Um, Kesa actually invited me. Um, we know each other because like, I am an Asian American artist, and we collaborated on a lot of things. Um, we worked together at like, Zine Fest, too. So all right. Like, okay. All how many of you are artists or writers or doing some sort of creative? Oh my gosh, all right. So I see why you're here. Um, and how many of you are interested in doing something with your parents' stories or your family's stories? Okay, great. And how many of you understand Vietnamese? That's cool. <laughs> um, would anybody feel comfortable like translating the gist of some stuff I'm gonna play for you for the, for the group? Great. Um, so I thought that, how, how much time do we have, Julie? Uh, we have right now maybe about 10 minutes. Okay, so um, maybe the most valuable thing that I can do for you in this short amount of time that we have is just dispel some myths um, that can happen kind of accidentally. Like, it's not on purpose. It's just when, when artists are asked to present their work, um, first of all, they freak out, like me. And, like, I am no exception. And then we dress up. I really wanted to wear my flannel sh shirt and like a, and a, and a beanie, but I was like, I need to be an adult. <laughs> so um, I try. I, I don't always succeed. And then also, you know, when, when you send your work to a museum, then the museum spiffs it up and, you know, your work gets put into f frames and you get nice wall text. So it becomes very formal. But the, what it actually looks like when you're making it is really messy, pencil smudges on the back of your hand, um, insecurity and doubt everywhere. Um, and so that's what I want to share with you today. The process of making is really messy and um, full, of, full of doubt. So if you feel that in your own work, it's normal. You're doing the right thing. Um, the process of researching is also a really messy and um, weird thing to do. Um, so I thought I would maybe share some of this stuff because like as a historian, it's kind of fun to play with primary sources. And it's so long ago, that process for me, that sometimes I forget to talk about it. Um, so why don't we start with some sound? Because I think sound has a way of um, bringing you back to a place that sometimes photographs don't even. So I interviewed my parents uh, when I was in grad school, and I found uh, an old, I, I was, um, I, I, I started watching Marie Kondo, <laughs> and I was, I was Marie Kondoing my office, and I found my old mini disc recorder, which is like some old technology from like the 90s. And these mini discs um, have some priceless stuff on them. They are my parents' voices telling me stories about Vietnam and their childhoods. And these are from 2010. Um, and I haven't listened to these since then because I didn't have anything to play them on. So I was really excited. I got them transferred. And now I have them on this cool thing that I get to DJ with. <laughs> um, so let's 
see. I'm going to play you. I'm going to play you my mom first. Um, this was really exciting because it was it directly went into chapter five where I draw her as a little girl in Vietnam and I had some photographs to work from. But what I was really, really drawing from was the way that she described herself and her relationship to her own mother. And that was really revelatory for me. Um, so here we go. <laughs> sạch rồi một chuyện lúc nào cũng mặc đồ trắng ôm cho thai quần áo lúc nào trắng tốt thế thì mà rất là thơm xong bà ngoại lại còn hút thuốc nữa và hút thuốc với cái thuốc với cái thuốc thơm đó. thành ra mà nhớ là mà, mà khoái thứ ngửi bà ngoại lắm rồi thành ra có cái mùi đó, nó, nó, nó lạ đó cái mùi thơm thơm mà cứ tới gần đây là bị bà ngoại đẩy ra thành ra giết ngồi mình không tới nữa um, Would anybody mind just like translating the gist of that for, for other folks? Okay. pictures of my grandma smoking, but that was definitely an image that I was like, man, I got to draw that. And Crazy Rich Asians was definitely not out at the time that I was drawing this, but like if I were to think of the woman I would base my grandmother's character on, it would be like Michelle Yeoh's character, especially at the end where she like goes to that gambling hall and she's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that kind of woman. And Again, like this is not really um, a character that I ever saw modeled to me in a movie about Vietnamese women. They were always like tragic mothers crying um, in like pajamas. Um, so I had to sort of make it up. But it turned out that like I based it on enough photographs and bits of um, artifacts that I collected from my family that it was, it was pretty accurate. I showed my mother and she was like, yep. That's your grandma. <laughs> um, and then with my father's stories, it was even harder because he was talking about a time of war and um, famine and people were like dying of hunger. So definitely nobody was taking photographs. Um, so I had to do a lot of like peripheral research just to get enough information to know what like people's clothes and hairstyles might have looked like or homes um, and then the rest um, had to use my imagination but here is my father talking about the uh, 1945 famine in the north <coughs> đi hồi đó bố đi thì bố đi từ năm hai tuổi bố đã phải đi như vậy rồi đi xong rồi lại về tại bệnh quá bị sốt đi đi vào rừng rừng gần biên giới chẳng là bố hai tuổi thì nó bệnh quá thì lại về về xong lại đi nữa đi sang hải phòng xong rồi lại về đến khi mà chết đói nhiều quá đó thì ông nội ông nội thì không có gió bố của bố thì là mấy nghề nó không không có gió là cái nghề là mình làm những cái giấy vàng giấy đất, bằng giấy để mình đốt cho người chết đó thì nó không có tiền thì đói nó không có gì ăn hết tại vì người ta chết nhưng mà mình vẫn còn có cái gì ăn này nhưng mình không chết mà nó đói cả ngày cứ cứ ngồi về với bố không có gì ăn hết đợi quá trời mới thấy má của bố đó luộc vài cộng cho muốn cho ăn ngồi ăn hai ba cộng cho muốn ăn tới không có cơm Thế rằng có nhiều khi là má của bố mua được con miếng huyết heo đó Huyết của con heo luộc á, gói vào cái đá chuối Thế về ăn đâu có dám cho người khác nhìn Thế là hai mẹ con chui vô buông bùng xuống á Xong ăn ăn thì xong ăn nó trùi sạch mép đi ra Rồi nhiều khi nhìn quanh nhìn quẩn không có gì ăn là có mỗi con mèo Thế là bố của bố đó Thế nên sách con mèo đập chết ăn cả nhà ăn mừng <cười> Anh ấy thấy no được vài ngày rồi lại đó, đói quá về sao? Ông nội ông 
hội của bố cũng nói bố cũng nói về sau chỉ cách là về lại cái bà nội lối đầu thôi thì mới có cơm ăn thì về thấy bố happy quá tại vì nó hết đói <cười> bà nội là lên âu nơ có tiền thì có gạo thì lúc đó có cơm trắng ăn nhưng mà nó không có được bao lâu thì bệnh minh nó lên tố khổ lại phải dọc nó muốn bảy thì luôn that was a bit longer but if anybody could paraphrase maybe <laughs> yeah. Right. I think he, at the beginning he said that in the north about two million people died from famine, um, and he didn't die, but he was in extreme hunger because he just had a tiny bit more than the people who didn't in order to survive, and then it was just really hard. Um, and then uh, he was talking about that part. I don't know if you remember in the book when. Uh, his mom bought uh, a blood sausage and then they ate it together um, in secret. And he was talking about that. <coughs> um, and then he said that eventually they came back to his grandma's house and then that relieved, alleviated the situation a little bit, but it didn't last long because um, the vet men came and uh, took everything. Yeah, thank you. Um, and again, these are like memories that I reconstructed um, just based on this exact interview. Um, photographs, um, what I did with the photographs that I did have was um, I did what I call input drawings. Um, are any of you cartoonists? Any of you planning on doing like visual stuff? Um, <laughs> it's great. So um, you know that photo reference can actually be like a major crutch when you're drawing comics because once you go with photo reference then you feel obligated to like keep finding the exact photo to reference and it can actually hold you back in terms of like your imagination. And so what I found was more useful was doing what I call input drawings, which was just studying the facial structure of my parents, drawing them from different angles, drawing them at different ages so that I like memorized their features and then I could draw them from my head in whatever emotion or pose I wanted to. And the same thing um, to a lesser extent with um, architecture and flora and clouds. And if you just like, um, if you can pay attention to your surroundings and like abstract everything or essentialize everything into the logic of a place, then you can reconstruct that place from memory. Like Eugene so far like, has this really beautiful quality of light. I mean, I haven't seen it rainy yet, but um, you know, there's like flatness, farmland, these amazing like oak trees and things with branches like this in the winter. Um, it's very pastoral. The creeks like are curvy rather than straight, like in farmland in California. Um, so far, no clouds. Vietnam has like a very different texture and shape. The clouds, I mean, everyone, I guess he's from Vietnam, I get, he's like, yeah, like the humidity, right? The clouds are big and they sit heavy on the horizon. Um, the, the trees, of course, have a different shape than here. Um, they don't lose their leaves. Um, and then also the people, like, are smallish and they wear their clothes in a certain way at different points in, 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 in time. So if you can, like, pay attention to those things, then you can reconstruct all of those things um, from your own imagination. And that's also a way for you to put your own stamp on your work. Because really, in the end, um, the most valuable thing that we have to offer as an artist is how we see. So you, if, if you can, especially if you have like sort of a naturalistic way of drawing or writing, you can feel like you're not getting things right or you're not like observing enough. But if you really remind yourself that what you're offering is your way of seeing, it really is quite freeing because then you have to just, your job is to, to be more you. And, and your job right now, at, at this point in your career or, or your development as an artist or writer, is to figure out who you are and what is unique about your voice and then just get better at being you. Um, I was gonna show some photographs, but I feel, I don't, it, I don't have a projector for it. 
So we'll skip that part and maybe I'll sneak it in. Are, are all of you going to the live reading afterwards? Okay, can I have some, can I plant some people in the audience for later? It would be really cool. I mean, if I usually need like three or four people to help me do the live reading. And um, it would be great if a couple of them um, spoke Vietnamese so that we get the names pronounced, like with good accents. And then also, um, I'm going to try to like take some vitamin C before the live reading and like up my energy <laughs> a little bit. Um, but if whoever uh, volunteers to do the, the voices with me just like brings a lot of energy to it. Um, do we have microphones for them later, Julie? Okay, so we'll just pass it. Okay, great. Um, does anybody feel like doing some voice acting during the live reading? Great, Mohammed. Cool. And anyone else? A Vietnamese speaker? May, okay, great. You met him last night. He asked the first question at the Q&A. Hi. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Yeah, okay. And then I'll need one more person. What's your name? Caroline. Caroline. Okay, great. All right. So um, this is good because like two male voices and one female voice corresponds to the characters. So um, do you do you want to be grandfather? Sure. Okay, great. He's like a dapper gentleman. He's pretty cool. Looks good in a suit. All right, great. And then um, Caroline, you're gonna have many parts. You're gonna play my mom, my sister, my other sister. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and you're also gonna play me. Oh, yeah. All right, Actually, great. Oh, no, wait, I feel, okay, I'm stressed. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, you're gonna be great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. As well as we're just gonna have some fun with it, and um, there's microphones, and I've done this a bunch of times, and. Um, I did it one time where I got, I just took volunteers from the audience and like this little girl was like, she was so eager, she couldn't read. <laughs> <laughs> she did fine. <laughs> so you're going to be great. <laughs> um, can I take any of your questions in the time that we have left? Or we could just have a discussion about storytelling, um, art, representation. <laughs> Yeah, we gave up. Uh, we put this in your gift bag earlier. Mm. But like a lot of us who contributed, so we made a zine in anticipation Aww. of your coming. So like, if we could look through it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's amazing. Immigration and identity. I like it. We go home. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it starts heavy, hey. Who wrote, don't sleep with the fan on at night, you might not wake up again. <laughs> Whoa. How does it end? <laughs> oh, nailed it. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> that is great. Man, Vietnamese American expression, Asian American expression has come a long way. <laughs> like, we're so edgy now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it used to be um, that you just couldn't get away from the slender girl in an auzai and ribbon dancing and, um, you know, the boy on a water buffalo. And now we get, you might not wake up again. <laughs> um, I actually did that thread. Oh, okay. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Mm. And that's like a very specific one, and so oh. there were different like superstitions, and yeah. a lot of people were like drawing from that. And like um, people, there's some material from Facebook. Um, there's one guy who comments on that, and he's like, "Yeah, my dad like, swears by that, and that's why like Korean fans have a timer, so oh. it'll turn off when you go to sleep in case you fall asleep." Yeah, and it was like a whole like it was on the news, like there's government warnings not to sleep with fans on um, during the summertime, and. There's like conspiracy theories that it was because they didn't want to use the energy, so it's kind of like this whole, like, <laughs> this whole big thing. And so there are like the further mythology of like superstitions, I guess, and how um, I get told that today. That is incredible. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> government urban legend to yeah. conserve energy yeah. as a country. Um, so maybe not too dark. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but kind of twisted. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Viet's have like a lot of, lot of crazy things that we grew up with too. Like, and I, I tried to put some of them into um, my childhood chapter. Like, don't answer a strange voice because it might be a spirit trying to enter your body. <laughs> um, yeah, all, all kinds of things to keep you up at night. So, I mean, everybody nods when I share these stories. Um, and so clearly, this is like a running theme through our lives. And yet, we have these other narratives like, the nice girl in the outside. <laughs> so I guess as writers and artists, like it's sort of our duty, right, to like um, move everybody away from the cliches <laughs> towards things that feel more accurate and true to our lived experience. And um, so I suppose that if you want to be a little bit activist -y about it, that could extend into nations' narratives about um, immigration and identity, who belongs, um, what kind of country we are. Uh, you know, anybody who studies a little bit of American history can say, no, we're actually not that welcoming of a country in a lot of ways. Um, we're, not an, we're not the Ellis Island beacon to all immigrants. Like, we have like, a lot of violence and a lot of um, periods where we excluded specific people. So the present is very much tied to the past. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised at the same time as we should still fight it. Um, knowledge, I think, is power. And um, as storytellers, we have an ability to um, shift the narratives once again from what's being told to us to what's actually accurate and, and true to our lived experience. And then we also have the power to um, tell stories that have been suppressed or not shared as widely. Um, <clears throat> and then, ultimately, when we become storytellers, we do have some responsibility, I think, to um, think about the limits of our own perspective and then try to do something about that, either expand our <clears throat> understanding of people who don't share our experience or sometimes just shut up and make room for the people who don't have the mic right now. Um, and if, I think if everybody could do that, we'd be all right. Um, I, I'm a little hesitant to say this because I'm on camera, but I'll, maybe I'll say it anyway. Um, <laughs> I mean, I honestly think that uh, if everybody was just 20% less asshole, <laughs> I mean, do, like we do the math, like, I think it'd be all right. <laughs> But, but what we have is like this division, um, like wealth is getting more and more concentrated. Um, borders are shutting down all over the world. Um, and then we also have like incredible um, acts of humanitarianism and, and bravery um, in the face of it. But sometimes like when you're in it, doesn't it feel like it's just you and your five closest friends and it's exhausting and who can keep that up? So the socialist in me wants everybody to take a little piece so we can all just be 20% less asshole <coughs> and share the world. Um, but in the meantime, we have to um, like do what we can to keep getting up every day and keep doing the work and uh, understand ourselves and what our tools are. So I think that's what you're here for, right? Like university is like such an amazing place to find out who you are, learn about the world around you, and sharpen your weapons. And that's something that you're going to keep doing for the rest of your lives, I hope. Um, <clears throat> don't go gently into that night. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's kind of a cliche, but I'm going <clears> to <throat> speak to you from your future. This is your future self coming back and telling your younger self right now, don't let your hunger die. Don't let your dreams um, fade away. You're hungry right now for so much, and that's a really, really important thing to hang on to. Um, and even though you have to adult and, and have jobs and responsibilities, 
Um, it's so, so important to hang on to the things that keep you up at night and keep you inspired and trying and searching. Um, if, if you can find other people to help you keep that fire alive, uh, it makes such a difference in the rest of your life. Um, just in your ability to, to be happy and fulfilled and keep doing things that change the world for the better. Thank you so much for being here with me.